Okay, I think we'll get started. I'm Shannon Doughty. Um, I'm uh, in the Department of Anthropology at University of Chicago. And I'm also this year a co-director for 3CT, which stands for um, the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory. And um, this is a series. Um, this is the, the third um, and final series for this academic year, but we're thinking about extending it next year of um, a, a new format um, that uh, we started up or I started up called Things in Theory. And this connects to a longstanding collaboration between Bill Brown and myself through 3CT. Um, uh, and of course, he uh, is famous, famously coined Thing Theory um, in an important article in Critical Theory. Um, and uh, we have collaborated over the years on uh, various um, programs and initiatives related to material culture uh, and contemporary theory. And um, the, this format, I, I really wanted to be dialogic um, to kind of get away from the um, stand up and monologue um, sort of academic presentation because it's just, I find this more um, congenial and intellectually interesting to just relax a little bit, take out the performance and turn it back to conversation and also to reconnect with friends that we can't see in person. Um, so um, I know we're at different time zones, uh, but feel free to get up and have lunch, uh, toast Alice with a cup of coffee, or if you're um, on the other side of the pond uh, with a cocktail. And um, I know that our attendance may not be at the highest right now for two reasons, that um, Germany is reopening and uh, restaurants are reopening. People might be anxious to be out on the patios, but this will be recorded. And, and on our side, um, in Chicago anyway, uh, at our campus, it's the last day of classes. So um, I think that there will be, there's a extended temporality to these events also that I think is really nice. Um, and uh, it's, um, shrinks space. So we're able to have these conversations um, across the pond that otherwise uh, um, take a lot more doing um, um, to happen. So we're trying to make the best of the Zoom situation. Um, and I want to express gratitude um, to Alice um, von Bieberstein for being willing to do this uh, and to share her work, which I have loved ever since I first encountered it. I met um, Alice, I don't know if you know this, but if you remember this, but six years ago at a, a, a conference uh, in Istanbul in uh, March of 2015, uh, which was has really stuck in my um, head for various reasons. Um, it, it really was an important recent event in my academic and in some sense personal life. I had a wonderful time. It was my second time to, to Turkey, but I hadn't been um, previous to that for, oh, I don't know, something on the order of uh, 20 some odd years. I'm going to date myself. Um, and it uh, I was struck again with the beauty of the city. I was struck also, though, with how much things had changed. And the title of the um, conference was, uh, which um, I, I believe you are one of the, the co-conveners, right, Alice, as well as a presenter um, uh, with um, Yael Navarro, who um, has also been an important collaborator and mentor, mentor for you, um, and co-editor uh, on a volume that came out of that conference. But it's called Reverberations, Violence Across Time and Space. And I was so impressed with that conference for numerous reasons. Um, one was just the quality uh, and diversity of the presentations. Uh, diversity also against uh, across rank. There were students as well as senior um, presenters um, from different countries, good representation from um, Turkey uh, and uh, Turkish scholars. And also, I don't know if you noticed, but a, a lot, a lot, a high number of strong minded women. And, and <laughs> Yeah, it was really wonderful. Um, and, and that was just kind of that wasn't on the agenda, but that just seemed to happen. And, uh, and we had uh, lovely um, dinners together. Um, the, the, the hospitality that you all showed uh, was really lovely. And that was March 2015. And shortly thereafter, both Turkey and the US kind of fell apart. And so we've been living reverberations of um, that um, 2016, or I, I can't quite remember when things really started to get bad in Turkey, um, but certainly for um, 
for us, um, <laughs> if I can um, speak for at least a people on my side of the political spectrum, uh, you know, it started um, towards the end of 2015 when the presidential election started to take the turn it was going to take. Um, although we still really didn't understand uh, all that was happening in terms of popular politics. And, um, and of course, the parallels and the contrasts uh, with um, popular authoritarianism, uh, which has been one of the themes that 3CT through other colleagues um, um, like uh, Lisa Wadin uh, have been pursuing, um, as well as some others, um, there are really interesting links between your work and some of the other um, scholars at 3CT um, who've been uh, thinking through um, contemporary um, uh, events um, that I'll, I, I might touch on uh, in the Q&A. But um, to uh, complete my introduction um, uh, of Alice before we get to uh, her introduction of um, her work, uh, she has a PhD in social anthropology from the University of Cambridge, completed in uh, 2012. Uh, and um, she has since 2018 um, been a research uh, associate, and I'm, I, I'm not going to um, offend your native tongue by trying to pronounce it. I'm going to translate it into English, but at the Center for Anthropological Research on Museums and Heritage at Humboldt University in um, Berlin. I also want to thank Alice who has the great privilege of visiting Berlin for another um, advanced seminar um, hosted by somebody else, but I got to visit Alice in her um, home and uh, the hospitality was just marvelous. Um, so I've been in that space and uh, have fond memories because of Alice of both um, uh, Istanbul and Berlin and places I hope to visit again one day. Um, and so what she's going to be talking about today uh, is a, a piece of a book that she's um, in that uh, we, we talked a little bit prior to this, the, the final uh, throws of lots, how to pull it all together and um, packed it as a book. But I can see already from what you shared with me, it's very far along and I really am looking forward um, to um, reading the whole thing once it's out. And, um, and I think it will uh, have reverberations, if I may, across um, uh, many different fields. I think that's one of the really interesting things about your work. Um, is I can see historians, a social anthropologists, um, and archaeologists, archaeologists all being um, equally engaged uh, in what you're doing. Um, uh, Alice, as you might expect, um, she has a very distinguished um, uh, career already, um, and she has published um, something on the uh, on. Uh, the order of about a, a dozen chapters and articles. You're already at that point where I'm not going to belabor your CD. Um, so just make a note of that. Um, so uh, what Alice is going to be um, talking uh, about today, let me see if I uh, have the title right, Treasure Hunting and Necrospeculation in Turkey, which is just such an enticing title. So I'm going to turn it over to you. One thing, uh, let me make a note to everyone now that most of our participants have probably beamed in about format. Um, we've created a, a, a hybrid Zoom experience where um, for the first part where Alice will um, be giving us an orientation to her work, which I have um, encouraged her to be um, informal about, and I think she's going to show some images through screen sharing. But we're going to, she and I are going to dialogue a little bit after her presentation, and then we're going to turn it over to Q&A. So while we're dialoguing, you see the two screens um, spotlighted. And then when we go to the open um, Q&A for everybody who's attending, um, we uh, will turn that off. So you may at that point, once I say we're going to general Q&A, um, do two things. One is to um, switch your settings to gallery view so you can see everybody in attendance. And secondly, if you could do the raise hand function um, so that I can take uh, questions in order, um, that would be really helpful to me. Um, and uh, if you would prefer to have um, your question in the chat for one reason or another, um, you, you may put it in there and I'll read it. Um, but uh, if possible, it would be nice to have people say hello and uh, utter their question themselves. So I'll turn it over to you, Alice. Welcome. Thank you, Shannon, so much. Um, yes, and uh, I mean, thank you so much for inviting me over to Chicago, which brings you back into my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> where we actually last where we last saw each other. So um, you know, this is you know, I, I just I'm so happy for the um, way you make use of this technology that's um, on the one hand wearing us out a bit, but at the same time also exactly um, allowing these kind of connections and um, the overcoming of all kinds of barriers and distances. And yeah, I appreciate it. it particular that you know if people join and join here for their lunch break or um, actually yeah, sort of uh, decide to spend their Friday evening as you mentioned with restaurants having reopened in Berlin or on this side of the pond um, and yeah the, 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 the research that I want to talk about a little bit and I, I think I'll just start um, sharing my uh, screen um, well, here we go so that you can see my does this work yeah, yeah. yes all right does. wonderful okay um yes so this actually takes us back to to that time of the the conference that you mentioned ah how am i going wait now i need to there we go um and uh, so yeah the research basically uh, it sort of yeah takes us back to that period um of the the mid 2010s which was a period of the um, the peace process in Turkey uh, between the Kurdish political movement and um, the Turkish state, and um, and it was also towards the sort of tail end of a of a period of liberalisation, which opened up some spaces to talk about certain histories of political violence in Turkey, and amongst them also, uh, you know, what we refer to as the Armenian genocide of 1915. Now, I conducted fieldwork in this place called Mush, which uh, you see in the far east of Turkey, there um, near Lake Van, um, and which is located, uh, the city, towards the south of a big plain that you see here. Um, and this plain in particular was inhabited up until 1915, mainly by Armenians, sort of up to 80%, um, and now is uh, a majority Kurdish populated region. Um, now, in 2013, the old part of town, which also encompasses the former Armenian quarters, uh, was targeted for an urban regeneration scheme. And these have really been very prevalent and dominated sort of urban planning agendas throughout Turkey for the best part of the last two decades. Um, and here, as in other places as well, um, it was initiated in a kind of uh, partnership between the local municipal government and the mass housing authority, which is called Toki in Turkey. Um, and I've, such projects really offer or provide some kind of microcosm to um, trace or think about reconfigurations in um, the broader kind of transformations um, of political economy, um, sovereignty, modes of governance, etc. So we can trace, for instance, um, the uh, transformation, and I'm going to show, the, so this is the before image, and now we see the after image. <laughs> um, yes, I know, and in the broader, I know. The, the, the historical preservation in me just, you know, Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So this is the, yeah, this is before and after. And um, now, unfortunately, you don't see it on this image, but basically it should be. Can you see my my, my cursor? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So it should be around here. This house that you see here, which is also part of the book, border book manuscript. So this is uh, one guy who basically somehow showed his finger to <laughs> manage, yeah, manage to kind of preserve his house. And here towards the left, you also see the ruins of, of um, what is known or what, what we think is the Surt Marine church. Uh, so it's one of the, the, um, the ruins of an Armenian church basically in the neighborhood. Um, but yeah, so this is the state of it uh, now. Um, and so we can trace, it really allows us to trace, as I, I wanted to say, sort of the transformation of, of local governments into um, market facilitators. And over the course of the last sort of decades, they've been equipped with um, sort of executive powers to uh, designate, plan and implement such um, urban regeneration schemes, often um, drawing on a discourse of emergency governments and sort of related legislation, you know, uh, ideas of lands, risk of landslide, earthquakes, etc. Um, and thereby also framing it in some ways as kind of a biopolitical preventative measure, but while it's of course really a, a kind of profit-making scheme for local governments, um, in fact. 
Um, but it's actually the, 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 this, this mass housing um, administration, Turkey, which is equipped with um, also executive powers to intervene and, and dispossess um, people and, and expropriate land. Um, Turkey was actually founded in the early 80s um, as a, a public housing authority, I mean, with, with the, the, the purpose to um, provide uh, affordable housing uh, and provide credits to cooperatives and individuals. But it's, again, under the AKP regime of the last decades, become um, actually a, a kind of real estate developer, uh, which has the power to, A, obtain public land at zero cost, and on top of it, and also to dispossess land for such urban regeneration schemes. So, uh, you know, what we can observe throughout the country has also um, happened in Moosh, um, people being violently dispossessed um, and displaced, but also um, they've been kind of indebted on top of it. And so the way it works um, uh, throughout the country is that residents are offered a, a flat in these uh, to be built uh, future and now present um, housing blocks. Uh, but uh, of course this happens on a, on a sort of calculated difference in price uh, between their former homes and these uh, future grand um, apartments. And this difference in value is then transformed, translated and imposed in the form of a debt on these already um, very, very poor uh, inhabitants usually. Um, so what was happening in Moosh is that people then kind of vacated their houses without much resistance. They um, went to demolish their um, former homes in order to um, sell, as you can see here, wooden beams, but also metal wires and kind of liquidate them in order to extract some sort of form of value from, from these remains. Um, and after all that was done, uh, and now we come to this other part of this, uh, the story, um, they proceeded to dig um, both underneath and in the vicinity of their previous homes um, in search for what is locally referred to as Ermini Altsen or Define, so Armenian treasures or gold. There is a, um, a widespread belief, of course, treasure hunting in many ways um, is a... Um, you know, a kind of widespread practice throughout the world. Um, but here locally, it really um, sort of un unfolds or unravels in, in, in the context of this widespread belief that Armenians buried, not only that they were, that they were quite wealthy, but that they also buried their valuables um, in the kind of context of generalized insecurity towards the late Ottoman Empire, but even more so in the face of deportation um, uh, in 1915. So people went to dig both with um, uh, shovels and hand tools, as you can see here, but also with uh, bigger machinery. Um, here we see um, uh, diggers, or I don't even know what the English word is for these kind of heavy machineries, but um, so you can see what is happening. Um, and um, there had actually been rumors that um, throughout the period and ahead, of the, and ahead of that process that it was actually really a plan of the state to um, reach and uncover and, 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 and uh, actually yeah, get a hold of all these riches that supposedly lie buried beneath the quarter. Um, there were rumors that there are some kinds of archives that have documents um, indicating the specific location of these deposits. Um, there were rumors you know, that the state would come and seal off the area from view, even build a whole wall around it and then go up, uh, go in and kind of turn the whole neighborhood upside down. And there were also rumors that the particular subcontractors that would be um, employed were actually descendants of survivors. So what are often referred to as Islamized Armenians, these refer to the descendants of those who survived um, the genocide by being taken up into Kurdish families and um, were then converted and um, Islamized. Now, most studies um, of urban regeneration schemes in, term, in terms of their historical perspective, actually quite shallow. Um, a lot of them take us back to, uh, ah, there we go. I want to stay there for a bit, um, to the, the sort of onset of rural urban migration in the 1960s. Um, but they don't really engage more thoroughly or deeper with the historical constitution of the land. But if we look at the particular scene, um, what we find and what I find, of course, very interesting is, um, on the one hand, that um, these sort of episodes of dispossession are recursive, um, if you will. Um, 
the most important archives we have to understand the cadastre um, office and and um, the archive of the the commissions for abandoned property that i'll speak a bit more in a second they actually remain closed and classified and inaccessible but um, thanks to the work of a number of historians over the last uh, two decades we actually now have a very clear picture of the laws and regulations that regulated um, the sort of economic dimension of the Armenian genocide which um, really entailed a mass transfer of wealth um, and actually Hari, Hari Tunyan of uh, the University of Chicago um, uh, mentioned in a book or, or referred to this um, in, in his book of, 19, uh, of 2019 as an act of primitive accumulation. So this act, these, these uh, throughout Anatolia, a number of commissions for abandoned property were set up around 1915, first to record all movable and immovable assets um, of the Armenians that were deported. Later, these were liquidated, and um, um, yeah, so here we have sort of one of these receipts. Um, <coughs> and this was basically, this was really constituted for the emergence of um, the modern Turkish uh, political economy or national economy. Um, and but what it was quite interesting actually at the period was um, that um, during, during, during the whole process as well as during the Republic, Republican period, um, the authorities were very keen to hold on to a principle of private property. So what this meant was that all these assets were recorded and liquidated and um, the commissions only claimed to um, sort of hold legal stewardship, so to speak, over the value of these properties. They even set up legal, they set up accounts, bank accounts, in which the values would be held in the name of these previous owners. But of course, so there was this whole view of a restitution um, and return. But of course, this was actually postponed indefinitely through various means. Um, that I don't want to go into in the moment. Um, and of course we find sort of similar forms of legal stewardship today um, and in the same way, you know, accounts were set up to pay compensation um, for the dispossession um, in the contemporary uh, case of urban regeneration. So this is kind of partly what interests me and also the whole sort of longer history of emergency governance that we can trace um, through these histories. But yes, so secondly, I find the the focus on treasures and practice of treasure hunting, um, a very productive lens to think through the more spectral, um, if you will, or informal um, aftermath uh, of the genocide. Because it reveals something, not just about this, this formal and, and, and very formalized and regularized uh, procedure for dispossession, um, but precisely the sort of more shadowy um, dimension of political economy and particularly also on how it relates to the intricacies of citizenship, um, political economy, and um, also uh, the question of complicity, really. So to give a short background again, in 1915, most Armenians um, in the area of Mush were actually killed on the spot. Um, some were deported, and as I mentioned before, a number of Armenian, uh, particularly children and young women, were taken up into families and then converted and survived. Um, a lot of Kurds, uh, and as well as refugees from the Caucasus and the Balkans, uh, came to settle in the villages. And throughout the, most of the 20th century, um, these Armenian material remains became the target of um, destruction, repurposing, um, resignification, etc. Um, within the sort of broader context of a, of a very vast and generalized politics of uh, denial uh, pursued by the Turkish state. But locally, we also have um, a, a somewhat nostalgic discourse uh, for this lost Armenian past, which stands for some kind of lost modernity because these Armenians are figured or imagined um, as the sort of productive, wealthy, urban, educated elements of society, you know, skillful artisans, etc. Um, so there's this nostalgic discourse, and we also have to keep in mind the, the sort of broader politics of recognition um, with regards to the multi-ethnic heritage of the region that's been pursued by the Kurdish movement over the last uh, 20 years in particular. Um, now, following the work of um, Laura Baer in particular and her colleagues, I um, have come to understand and conceptualize this practice of treasure hunting um, as a, what she refers to as a vernacular practice of um, speculation, something that continues to exist um, together with or alongside uh, scientific and empiricist um, modes of knowledge production, knowledge practices, but also sharing uh, certain commonalities with uh, 
prophecy and other divinatory um, divination, divination practices that aim really at capturing more sort of incalc and, and as he seems more incalculable um, futures. And this is evident here in um, the assemblage of sort of tools and techniques, um, relations and forms of knowledges and the kind of particular strategies that are pursued in order to capture, of course, what lies essentially um, invisibly underground. So um, these um, involve uh, metal um, detectors, uh, but also maps um, that are often sought um, from um, sort of relations that are in particular sought after and noted in, in relation to Armenians and descendants who are believed to hold, of course, special knowledge with regards to the particular places of treasures. Um, but it also involves a kind of uh, acquisition of a, a, a special and somewhat specialized and maybe somewhat obscure knowledge in the semiotic reading of um, signs and symbols. Um, there is also a bunch of beliefs and, and practices around magic, um, spells and, and, and poison. Now, um, Bear and her colleagues, they argue that such vernacular practices of speculation proliferate in particular in the context of um, increases in sovereign debt. And we see this here in the context, really also, of course, in the context of, 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 uh, of an increase in, in, in private indebtedness, also as a result of these mortgage, pay, like mortgage payments that people have to do as a result of these urban regeneration projects. Um, now, so, and all of these, they, they kind of increase the pressures of um, extraction. And the subsurface soils, of course, um, have uh, long been a privileged speculative object for the operations of capital. But um, the underground, and that is, I think, what we see here, is, is it is a site of economic opportunity for these treasure hunters. But the subsurface soils have, of course, also been a privileged terrain for claims to and operations of sovereignty. So um, my argument is in a way that um, treasure hunters, if treasure hunting, if you will, kind of branches off from this um, contemporary fetishization of the land and of natural resources and kind of mobilizes the land um, as marked by um, foundational uh, sovereign violence. Um, it constitutes exactly this kind of speculation on death, a form of necrospeculation that seeks to capture value from the underground that stems um, exactly from, the, from its nature as a repository of, of um, sovereign violence. So in that sense, treasures, if you will, constitute a kind of excess um, of the violence of 1915 that could not be integrated into Turkey's national economy. Um, so in general, then, in, in, in terms of the whole process, the whole, the whole project, uh, research project, I'm really um, concerned with the afterlives of um, these Armenian material remains in the after the catastrophe, um, remains that are both, of course, exist both in real terms as well as uh, phantasmatically, and how they've become entangled um, within the sort of broader histories of citizenship, political economy, minority governance, um, etc., and how they're mobilized both by individuals and groups um, that are differently positioned, of course, um, and mobilized in ways to sort of capture value and um, in ways that is itself sort of um, intimately actually connected and tied to the question of survival. Yeah, and that's, um, I think, all I wanted to say. Um, here are some more digs and some more images of these scattered remains um, that maybe capture something with, again, the Sulp Arakelots uh, part of that uh, monastery in the background. And I'll share my screen, uh, stop sharing my screen. Thank you. <laughs> okay. yeah. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Alice. Um, now I have more questions, but I'm going to try to keep mine to uh, maybe two or three before I, I want to save time for um, the, the larger audience. Because um, I, I know there are people in the audience who know more about Turkey than I do or about Armenia. Um, I, uh, I am so struck um, by on how many levels that you have productively already touched. Um, treasure hunting works, um, uh, but it, it, it really reminds me of an old, what's become an older trope, um, but you give new value to it for me, which is um, excavation as memory, uh, which is what um, Freud, um, um, you know, Freud was uh, an amateur archaeologist himself, or at least a collector. He loved to think with the um, allegory uh, of archaeology and of digging, and that was what he saw um, 
psychoanalysis as, as a um, assisted excavation of the layers of the psyche, and you don't know what you're going to find. But the other way in which, um, you know, and I've played with this myself, um, as, as you know, like how to extend playfully in some sense, although this was a very tragic case, and I was also talking about violence and trauma, um, Freudian ideas to collective consciousness and unconsciousness. Um, so there's a way in which I think a lot of anthropologists um, have been sort of, um, you know, it, there's a level of interpretation uh, we, that is very attractive to us to try to uncover the unconscious, um, uh, co un uh, collective unconscious, you know, and, and repressions, right? So there's reverberations and then there's repressions. So I think I'm going to start. So those are, you know, in, in all, I just want to acknowledge that there are so many connotations um, and things that seem to be happening semiotically and psych psychologically, politically, economically through treasure hunting that I, we're not going to exhaust it in an hour. And that's why I'm so excited about the book. Um, but let me ask questions that maybe move from the particular case of, of Turkey and then extend out in some just kind of what if comparative um, thoughts I had. Um, but one of them uh, immediately touches on memory, uh, which you didn't explicitly in this um, uh, presentation talk about, but I'm wondering, um, one of the things uh, when you were um, uh, speaking and also the little bits that I, I've um, read and heard, um, the the rumors um, it seemed to play a really big part of keeping treasure hunting alive um, as a practice. Um, whispers about what's happening, what the state is doing, uh, what individual, you know, Armenian disappeared actors are doing, whether they're dead or living. Um, and uh, I was struck this time more than um, other times that I've engaged with your work about the crossover. There's a word that occurred to me, which was conspiracy. And um, at 3CT, um, Joe Masco and, and Lisa Wadeen and, and others have been engaging for several years now, um, uh, particularly Joe Masco's work on conspiracy theory. Um, and they've done um, conferences in the theory and a, a, and a book coming out. And of course, it's been in US politics, um, something on our minds um, very much. And that why, why do conspiracies crop up? What's their group? You know, we're kind of revisiting group psychology, um, you know, which is something that anthropologists tend to be allergic to. But um, I wonder um, if I can just ask you a what if question. If the Turk, so there, there's a sense of, uh, of secrets, and, 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 you know, and this is also a Freudian thing, right? Precisely when you prohibit somebody from doing something from accessing an arc, archive, from talking about something, that that's repression and then it will come out, come out in some other way, right? Which we could see as treasure hunting. So I'm wondering um, about the uh, Turkish state's denial of um, continuing public denial of the genocide that creates a secret that then needs to be excavated because everybody still knows it happened, right? Especially in your region. So if this is a what if question. So just take it wh wherever you want to go. If suddenly there was a regime change and the Turkish state acknowledged the genocide, does your hunting disappear? Or do you, you think you, other you, things moving it along? Shannon, 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 this is like you ask everything. I mean, you are asking <laughs> okay. about everything, I know, you know? I know. Uh, this makes it really difficult because like we have to talk about, yeah, his, I mean, maybe not so much, I mean, not, so Break it down. Break it down. Just take one no, little yeah, piece okay. of it. Yeah. Not just historical consciousness, and not just collective unconscious, but it's also historical consciousness. Okay. Uh -huh. Because, and 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 the way this, yeah, and the way this sort of interacts or is interlaced with particular questions of citizenship. So with a particular role and historical role accorded or played by and kind of the, the, the entanglements of the Kurdish minority or majority, whatever. I mean, the Kurdish <laughs> population in Turkey and all of this. The question very important of territory, okay, because, um, or land question in general, I mean, it's like, it's, 
Yeah, there, it's a lot. Also conspiracy. I mean, no, sorry, it's just like, you know, when you talk, it's like my mind was going all over the place and now I don't because I would have to tell you everything. So, okay, I'll try. I'll try maybe to pick out one or two things. So in terms of conspiracy, I think, um, of course, the, 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 the Turkish public life thrives on and is being animated and the whole political landscape is being animated from the start by the threat and the specter of separatism, okay? And this is also because from the very start, you know, this has been a very unstable sort of state project because it was contested from the start because, you know, and it is continued to be contested and this specter of separatism um, and um, of, yeah, recessions of land is of course forever mobilized, you know, in, 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 very, in, in, very, in very many ways. Um, of course, to criminalize, suppress, terrorize, imprison, kill Kurds, I mean, particularly Kurds. Um, but it is also an unresolved question, for instance, for the Kurdish movement itself, which on the one hand, yes, you know, is uh, very vocal about human rights, it's very vocal about brotherhood, it's a very, like, of the, of the people, you know, you have, Ar like, Armenians who are MPs for the pro-Kurdish party, um, so there's all of, the, there is that whole kind of embrace, as I said, also of the multi-ethnic like, sort of multi heritage. Um, but at the same time, there is, you know, I, I you find a lot of people who are very close to the Kurdish movement who are also heavily invested in, in, in treasure hunting and who have no problems with digging in around churches or cemeteries or whatever, okay? So there you are precisely, like, you know, there, there you come to the question of historical consciousness and this kind of, like, on the one hand, as I said, there is this general knowledge, yes, memory, if you will, um, which also manifests in terms of, you know, names and, and kind of memories of gorgeous landscapes. Um, Adnan Cilic has worked uh, very much about sort of the, the sort of memory, uh, particularly among Kurdish speakers, in terms of the memory traces within the language itself in relation to landscapes. And of course, it's, it's within every single family of the region. About 80% of the people in Mush have one or two survivors children mostly, you know, who were picked up and sort of integrated. So there is always a great grandmother, there is always a great grandfather who, yes, we know was Armenian, but then, you know, itself had to be subjected to all forms of incorporation, abjection. You know, the, these survivors were recorded by the Turkish state, but at the same time they were recorded and surveyed just for them to disappear and kind of, you know, and sort of, so there's all of these things. But what I wanted to say exactly, so the Kurdish movement on the one hand, you know, they pursue this sort of politics of recognition, but at the same time, they are, they are like those who are involved or committed to that politics also have no issues with going after. But, and that itself, of course, has to do with the sort of economic impoverishment and, and all kinds of other dimensions in, in the present moment. But it also has to do in some way with the sort of unresolved question of what actually is the politics of the Kurdish movement with regards to land and territory, because, you know, they live in very many ways precisely on the land that was left behind, so to speak, you know. So anyway, I'm just uh, scratching the surfaces here and, and, and throwing all kinds of lights around. But, you know, you, you open up a Pandora's box. Well, um, I think that's your project is a Pandora's yeah. box, but it's a super interesting one. Yeah. Um, I, um, the other thing um, that's related to this, uh, that just struck me so much uh, is the way in which, um, and I, for for being a practicing archaeologist among the hats I wear, um, I haven't ever thought about this as clearly as you made me think about it. Although I'm definitely extending um, what you're saying, which is how the state relates to the territory of the underground and how people relate to what is underground as a space of pregnant imagination, I guess I would say, like, you can almost imagine anything you want emanating or being buried underground. And so this made this had my head spinning about um, different forms of territorial sovereignty that that are vertical, um, rather than horizontal. Um, and I've worked with um, students or, or, or attended uh, workshops in the papers that um, talk about mining rights, for example or water column rights, um, which are also vertical and temporary. There's all these other kinds of rights and possessions that states 
adjudicate, though differently, right? Different states have different resources and different histories and um, uh, and different relationships to the quote unquote, you know, um, free market with regards to um, uh, rights. So, so the other thing um, I was thinking, of, so I was thinking about what I wanted to ask you um, if you have thought about it um, in in your case or more um, uh, comparatively about the relationship of treasure treasure hunting to other uh, undergrounds. Mm. Um, and one of the words that um, struck me was prospecting, because prospecting seems like uh, in a mining context, um, particularly you, you can have a DYI. There are still people in my native California who go out in the Sierras where the 1849 gold rush, uh, where, I, where my um, one of my best friends from high school's brother still makes his living doing this. It's not a huge living, but he goes out and he prospects gold in the uh, remote river region um, uh, in remote rivers of um, the Sierra. And um, that's a kind of very um, material speculation that can happen on um, state sanctioned uh, like state state mining or state oil um, if it's a petra um, state uh, level but it also can happen at the DIY level um, we have of course across the world um, metal detectorists looking for coins um, and the conflict with archaeologists are very interesting but then there's archaeology right so not only do we have and the way that states um, regulate access to that underground, resource and it's a resource of the imagination as well as imagined wealth through cultural tourism um, is interesting um, and i'm wondering to what extent that comes up here at all um, in this incredibly important from a antiquity point of view region um, you know does the state try to um, prohibit this because there's damage there's um, a concern about damage to more um, ancient uh, uh, treasures, um, and and then the other underground uh, I I was thinking about was burials, and this gets to the necro and necro speculation rather literally, because um, in in different contexts there are different relationships that the state has or doesn't have. Sometimes it has a laissez-faire relationship to what people do with the dead and in some other context um germany actually is one of the clearest cases it's highly regulated by the state so just wondering about what treasure hunting's relationships might be to other undergrounds either state controlled or not um i think because the, the broad project really tries to focus on these armenian material remains i haven't focused on that i have to say so i think my things are more like um be more uh, spontaneous. Um, I'm thinking that, um, I mean, what it, what it evokes in me is that, of course, all these questions, uh, both mining um, as well as archaeology, are entangled with sort of imperialism and, 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 and sort of the anti-imperialism of, um, of uh, the Republican project, right? Because, as you might know, archaeology, you know, um, especially in the 19th century Ottoman Empire, you know, was a kind of became, I mean, it, it, it went through its own kind of history because it was really the imperial powers who, um, you know, were very invested in um, archaeology, particularly in the west of the country and just took stuff away. And then in the late sort of 19th century, the Ottoman Empire came around to sort of actually come up with some regulations and sort of started claiming these as imperial property of sorts so to regulate this but also with and this kind of embeds in this whole um yeah in the whole demise of the ottoman empire and these relationships of ox what metamesca is called occidentalism and the kind of projections um you know sort of within turkey or ottoman empire onto what europe is and the kind of whole anti-imperialist sort of line um and I think this, so that's, that's I think, one, um, I mean, you know, of course, the underground in that sense is so um, important for, I mean, in, in you know, it figures so, it figures so strongly in all kinds of independent, like, movement, independence movements and, you know, sort of attempts or in these imaginations and how it drives, you know, to 
to to to uh, yeah in, in these kind of projects of modern sovereignty obviously obviously right um, so this is very important at the same time nowadays um, of course we have a lot of there's a lot of concessions to foreign mining companies particular Canadian mining companies but again mostly in the west of the country so given and this is so again there is a particular maybe history towards the southeast which uh, throughout the Republican period has been both the site of extraction or but and and sort of, and, and, and uh, there's always been this twin side of sort of incorporation through development because of this appeasing, appeasing the region, you know, kind of like in response to, to the political turmoils and the conflicts and the contestations. One thing is development, but it's also repression. And repression happens sort of, there's always this, this twin thing, development, but also economic neglect, you know, and ex forms of exclusion. So most the region itself is one of the poorest of Turkey. There's like zero development, there's no industry, nothing. I mean, it's just so and there's no mining from what I know so this is not it hasn't really come into my the, the, it's more about um, in the region it's more about large infrastructure projects um, it's more about dams that are being built um, and in that sense it's really more about the history of colonizing the region because it is about um, you know so it's not so much about um, it's it's more about like it's still I think in some sense about gaining sovereign control um, and confirming and consolidating sovereign control over the region through techniques of colonialism. And these take the form of dams, um, large infrastructure projects and the construction of military checkpoints. So the militarization of the region. So I think these in terms of the, the sort of land politics, it's more state land politics, more that than um, their investment in kind of underground projects in the region. Okay, yeah. that's really helpful. I have questions about magic and Armenian ghosts, but I, I think uh, I need to turn it over to um, uh, the Q and A. So, um, if you'd like to, um, we're go yes, we're going to uh, our more conversational um, uh, or uh, our larger conversation. And um, I let me try to see. I think, and if I butcher your name, I apologize. Is it um, Gochin? Do you have a question? Yes. Yes, sorry uh, for today. I'm not opening my camera because my internet connection is terrible. I hope this works. Uh, hi, Alice. Thanks for this wonderful presentation. Hi, <laughs> hi to everyone. Uh, I have two questions actually. I was, I mean, from I was at that conference in 2005. In 15 in Istanbul also, and it was really wonderful. And from that moment, this question triggered in my mind, I mean, regarding the whole project, actually, but I'm now asking to you, I, I have the chance now. What difficulties did you have in the region while doing research? Because it's a very disputable region. And I mean, you are working with Kurdish uh, people, right? I mean, it's more difficult. You're working on the Armenian issue. <laughs> you're talking, uh, the, the majority of the population is Kurdish, and I'm curious about your personal experiences and how did you overcome them? And my second question is about uh, the relation, I, I mean, to put it really quickly, um, the personal relationship of these uh, treasure hunters with the dead. I know that from my own work, historical work, that, uh, that the majority of ordinary people in Turkey are afraid of the dead. I mean, we know that they have a sense of this living with the dead. You know, Yahya Kemal Bayat, the leading poet of the 20th century, he said, we live with our dead. So the dead are kind of living with us all throughout lives. Aren't they afraid of these sacred places? So how do they, all, I mean, all those amulets or all those magic, were they forms of protection or, I mean, Thank you. Should I answer straight away? Yeah, or, yeah okay. that, that was similar right. to my question. Go ahead. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll try to be quick. Um, um, thank you, Gökçen. I wish I could see you, but I'm waving like this. Um, so regarding the first question, I think my, uh, of course, uh, yeah, it wasn't easy. And um, I only, I had to dosage my, my kind of stays because yes, it was, you know, it's, it's um, a very provincial, it's a very conservative, it's a very um, patriarchal, uh, uh, of course, um, corner. Um, and uh, that wasn't always easy. But um, I was uh, fortunate enough to have um, a really fantastic uh, research um, assistant, Nejmiye Boz, who's been now in prison for four years. So there's also 
I owe all of this to her. Um, and um, she helped me maneuver um, the space um, and really sort of was absolutely crucial in kind of being that buffer that kind of opens doors but kind of helps me withdraw and all of these things. I couldn't have done it without her, really, I have to say. Um, otherwise, I think my position as a German or whatever, as something, I think was um, in many ways helpful in some strange ways because, you know, I am not, um, I mean, of course, there's all this necropolitical involvement of the German state in the whole conflict of the region. And I'm sure I was reminded um, very often that the tanks that have been killing Kurds are also German tanks and all of these things. But within the kind of topic of my research, I think um, it's uh, been a bit uh, easier. I mean, because, for instance, for Islamized Armenians, you know, I was like almost as, as good as an Armenian and there was a lot of kind of open up to me. Um, <clears throat> most Kurds were kind of in any case welcoming. Um, it was more and, and it was in a period also where you know the AKP uh, was still pursuing a kind of politics of zero uh, of, of kind of uh, you know sort of reconciliation also with Armenia. Um, so it was in a period where it was actually okay also peace process you know uh, the police was kind of held back and so it wasn't um, so difficult i think the second question um, about the relation to the dead um i think that um i didn't i think that's what struck me in a way i didn't see that you know and i think that was also disturbing to me in many ways um particularly when armenian groups were coming to visit and i was kind of uh, caught in the middle with sort of often Armenian visitors saying, but why do they do this? Why would they do this? Like dig around these cemeteries, like our graves and our churches, you know, like we don't understand. And a lot of my Kurdish friends were like, but what's the problem? And I, I was kind of left, it's, it's something that I still haven't been able to kind of figure out really. Um, but um, I think the, only, the, the way it makes a reappearance, and that's what I've written about a bit more, is also through this, the return of, our, of the Armenians as these kind of figures that, um, I mean, there is a kind of idea of divine justice, you know, that, that, that you can't hold on to the treasures because actually Armenians, you know, they cast spells on the treasure, they kind of have the knowledge, so they're, they're, they still have a power of, of, of accessing or keeping or controlling access to these, um, to these riches, you know. So they, they come back in, in multiple kind of phantasmatic and moral and different ways, they return with a, a kind of a power and authority actually, um, you know, that I think th that's how I would say, it's not so much fear of the dead, but th th they, they come back in a different kind of way, maybe. Um, thank you. So I think uh, we have three questions. One in the chat that I um, overlooked, it was actually our first question. Uh, Magdalena, are you here? And then it'll be Jeremy and then Alyosha, and then we'll probably be at time. Hi. Hi, Alice. Um, great to see you. Um, and thank you for your great talk. Um, that is fascinating to me for on so many levels, also because I am currently doing similar research on Jewish treasures in uh, East Central Europe. Um, so I have, I have two questions that, um, that relate to that. First question, you um, mentioned that this phenomenon of uh, treasure hunting and uh, digging is a recurring phenomenon. Um, and you mentioned as one of the, um, as one of the um, kind of the reasons propelling that, these economic reasons. Are there also political reasons propelling this cycle of treasure hunt? Um, and by that, I mean, um, power vacuum, political periods of transition or, or uncertainty or crisis um, that, that kind of cause this phenomenon like uh, they do in, in Eastern Europe. And my second question would be whether you have any accounts of survivors themselves claiming these treasures in the immediate aftermath of the genocide? Um, okay, thanks Magdalena. Again, I'll try to be quick. Um, I think it's largely economic reasons, to be honest. Um, I think the stories really often start from, I mean, it's mostly done by young men um, who are unemployed. I mean, it gravitates. It's not exclusive, but it gravitates around the sort of conjunction of, of, of youth, unemployment, um, and it really emerges precisely from, from the sort of uh, crisis of work that we also know from other corners of the world and the, 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 the crisis of masculinities and, um, and boredom, really boredom, you know, boredom because men have to be out, they can't stay at home, they have to be out in the market, they hang out with their boys, what are they going to do? They can't find jobs, they, but they have to get 
smartphones, they have to get, you know, build families, build a home, all of these things. So they go out because what else is there to do? So these are often the stories in which, you know, how these emerge. Um, of course, politically, um, it go, you know, it is inscribed in a longer history of complicity. That's what I tried to capture as well. You know, it is the tale and also of the complicity, of course, in some sense of the Kurdish population in this original violence. So there is a political component, but it's not about changing regimes very much. Um, um, and regarding the accounts of survivors in the immediate aftermath, no, I don't know. I mean, there were, of course, I mean, you know, Armenians, uh, especially before the end of the, the before the, um, between the end of the, se of the First World War and the declaration of the Republic, there were certain different periods in which Armenians tried to return, but there were all kinds of administrative measures of trying to prevent these returns. Um, and, um, you know, and then, uh, I mean, in many ways, you know, all of the land was occupied and, and, you know, it was very clear. I mean, the power discrepancy is just not even, I mean, we don't even have to talk about it, you know. So there is no way. And up until today, there are always, there are still stories of Armenians trying to come back and trying to claim. Um, I mean, there are stories of, of people having knowledge about richness and, and, and gold or whatever that's buried. Um, and uh, yeah, but also stories of, of violence, of killings, and, and of, of um, yeah, of people not tolerating this, of course, at all. I mean, and uh, essentially, um, but yeah, that's. Thank you. Jeremy. Thank you so much, Alice and Shannon, as well. It's always uh, such a great pleasure to listen to you speak about your research, and I feel like this is the most comprehensive. Uh, view of it that I've had thus far. So I'm looking forward to the book, of course. There are many things we could talk about, but I, I want to return to some of Shannon's uh, final comments about the underground, uh, but uh, to to sort of turn them in a different direction. I, I wonder if you thought about your research in relationship to the surface of the ground as well. So I'm thinking here, of course, nationalism and its projects of sovereignty uh, relate to surfaces uh, of the territory in all variety of ways, but particularly in Turkey, as you know, of course, you see these mountains, especially in Kurdistan, tattooed with Nemutlu uh, Turkum uh, DNA, and then uh, in another way, of course, uh, issues of eminent domain, uh, which you already touched on with Toki, but then thinking about Ikiz Dere and Rize nowadays, uh, uh, the, the, the state having such a sort of sovereign interest on the surface of the land. So I'm wondering if uh, there's any commentary to be made about treasure hunting as a sort of Im imminent critique of the Turkish state's sort of relationship to the land in a more phenomenological sense, maybe even. That's a question to think about, Jeremy. <laughs> now, of course, I mean, as I mentioned before, and my response also to Shannon is the, 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 the sort of this project of, I mean, that, uh, you know, territory, of course, in the Southeast have been, it's been this major uh, um, um, surface for uh, uh, the colonial kind of um, incorporation and, and, of course, spectacular staging of statehood in many ways. Um, so in that sense, uh, sure, there is, in, if we go back to also Shannon's, um, you know, uh, problematization of memory, and and all the kind of uh, nuances or or complications in terms of, yeah, what is actually going on in terms of historical consciousness or knowledge in relation to this digging with these figures coming back, all of these, I think it becomes very complicated, of course, and it opens up a very, you know very, very complicated dynamics that maybe you, you are right to say, you know, is is maybe also facilitated by the fact that it's underground and not happening on the surface, but that's a longer uh, discussion. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Alyosha? Uh, I, I apologize, uh, I didn't pronounce your name right. Oh, no, you did? Okay. You're absolutely right. In fact, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, so thank you so much for sharing your oath. Well, first of all, for doing that work, it sounds really, it's really important. I can only imagine how difficult it was, so that it sounds like your research assistant was crucial. And also thank you, Professor Dottie, for hosting, for putting this all in conversation. It's a really interesting idea. Um, so I work on Cyprus, um, where um, we also have a lot of, you know, properties that get in the way of development and ruins that are um, uncomfortable to deal with. Um, so I was really struck by the first two images you showed with the, and the, especially with the one house remaining with the, so I wanted to ask you to maybe talk more about that. And, and when I'm asking about that, I, I just 
wanted to hear more from you about how the people who were given the apartments or who had to sell their houses, how they perceived this um, expropriation. Is it, um, I mean, obviously it's much to generalize, but is it a, an understanding of progress? So oh, we're getting modern houses, which I know some people do. Is there a sense of memory? Just maybe can you share some more about the mm -hmm. like, perspective of that development? Okay. Okay, I'll be very quick as we're reaching the end. Um, uh, yes, um, I think people feel quite defeated generally um, in Turkey, unsurprisingly. So um, it's uh, particularly with regard, like when you face the sort of full, full force of the state, um, there is not much you can have in your hand. And um, I think for the most part, people were very clear that if they would go to court and say, I don't want to be appropriated, that would just completely, you know, <laughs> we have no effect whatsoever. So um, I think that's why people acquiesce. It's just, you know, survival mode in many ways. Um, of course, mourning the loss of the neighborhood, you know, the fact that you can just leave your kids and all of these things. Of course, apartment life is very different from such a neighborhood life and people kind of, you know, mourn the loss of these thick walls that are climatically so much kind of more appropriate. You know, they keep warm in the winter, they keep cold in the summer. So all of these things. Um, with regards to this house, this is uh, the story of Erjan, who precisely knew very well that uh, exactly he would lose any kind of case in court. So, um, as I've uh, mentioned in our little conversation to Shannon beforehand, he was clever enough to go uh, to the provincial sort of uh, um, council for heritage. I don't even forgot what the precise name was, um, and got it listed as a heritage site, um, which allowed him to keep the title deed so he did not have to transfer his title deed but at the same time he's sort of caught of course in a kind of dead end because having it now listed means the state cannot really go and expropriate or demolish his house but he can't do anything about the house because he would have to of course uh, you know yeah conform to certain you know uh, heritage credit whatever like conservation criteria in terms of any kind of construction work at the same time, of course, he doesn't have any money because he's poor. I mean, that's why he lived there, right? Because he's poor. So he doesn't have money to actually, you know, uh, implement or kind of uh, start, kickstart some kind of conservation project. So he's stuck. He has his property, but he can only see his, you know, house slowly falling into pieces because he can't, he doesn't have the means. And of course, the state and the municipality will never give him all of the money that he wants in order to rebuild and, and kind of save his house. So. Um, yeah, that, that's all I can say. It's, it's an interesting, again, in terms of question of private property, also how he relates to the Armenian visitors. I and mean, he's very involved in the Kurdish movement, which from where he gains the strength, of course, to actually show the finger and kind of pursue this, because like, you know, that's of course a part of his politicized background. And he also, it's very interesting the way he, yeah, as I said, the way he engages and, and how he, you know, frames his house as not just, it's not just about his property, it's also about all these Armenians and that he doesn't, you know, they come, it's valuable to them, you know, but he always kind of played this double thing, like this is unjust, so I'm fighting the injustice, but it's also about historical works, you know, it's also about the sort of heritage that we have to maintain. And so it's also, again, it's also an interesting question to the political, like Kurdish political movement, but so there's more to say about this, but um, I'll end it here with heroic mm. Erdan in this story. Yeah, there is um, so much more to say. I'm, I'm fascinated by the contradictory politics of, um, of heritage and uh, historic preservation because it, it cults, cuts multiple ways for multiple actors. Um, and uh, thank you so much. This felt like an appetizer and um, that made me hungry for the whole meal. So I, I think we've um, created a lot of eager readers. And yes, um, if everyone joined me in um, thanking uh, Alice for her um, time and her generosity and thank you so uh, much and her complicated arrangements between um, kitchen and childcare in the evening. I really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And I, I, I hope Bye. we can meet for a real meal um, sometime soonish. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Uh, Bye. Have a healthy and restful summer. I don't see you.